All right, we got some big topics tonight. We're going to talk about integration BC style. We've got two topics that are specific to our BC curriculum. Um, and so we've pretty much at this point, uh, this is what I consider our halfway point through all the review. We've put three really solid weeks into reviewing the AB topics and really going back to our fundamentals. So today, let's start off with a talk on parts. We're already pretty good at it, and of course, we want to try to push ourselves and get to that next level where we don't get it right most of the time. We get it right every single time, and we'll try to talk about some of the twists and turns that we've seen on the AP exam uh, in recent trends. So, But our formula says if you're integrating u times dv, that's equivalent to an antiderivative of uv minus the integral of v. DU. And we're doing really good with that formula. Now what are some of the bear traps that they're going to throw at us on this particular one? Um, I'm going to shrink my pen size. You know, probably the biggest trick is what do we do if they have bounds all of a sudden? You know, what if it's the integral from A to B? Well, then it becomes you take the entire antiderivative and you evaluate that from A to B. And specifically, I could probably rewrite that as um, we've got UV Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. Uh, evaluated from A to B. And then the new integral from... Why is my pen not working? Hmm. All right. Hopefully we can get through this video with this pen. But anyway, that's what the bounds would look like. You'd not only apply, that, apply them to the new integral, but don't forget about that little UV right there that also needs the bounds being applied to it. Um, you know, what are some of our favorite tricks with parts? Of course, we love tic-tac-toe when it works. Um... You know, and that's what we hope to use every single time. Uh, but the trick with tic-tac-toe is you've got to have a U whose derivative leads you to zero. Otherwise, you've got to take the long road, and that means picking your DV first. And that's what I want to highlight here. Step number one is to pick your DV. We said we want it to be the ugliest part that is still easily integratable. And then you can also pick, uh, you know, then pick your U, and then we're going to have to calculate uh, step three, we'll say, is to calculate uh, your V by integrating dV, and then you'll have to calculate du by derivating your U, and then we can make the appropriate substitutions and finish it out. So let's get ready. We'll jump into a few. Real quick, there's one there that we've, we've done a pretty good job of memorizing, and that's the integral of the natural log of x. If you recall, we said, all right, we're going to let dV be dx, and then U be the ln of x, and we ended up with x ln of x minus x plus c, and that's been a fun one that saved us a lot of work lately. The other interesting one is the arc sine of x dx. Um, we just saw that on a test recently. It's also worked out all the way through in our notebook. And the big trick there is, that, again, letting dv be dx, which is not necessarily an obvious move, but one that we're semi-comfortable with. Now, the first one I want to work through today is x squared times the natural log of x. And the first question I pose to myself is, first of all, why do I know its parts? Well, the trick here is, is it's the product of an algebraic function, a polynomial like x squared, and a transcendental function like natural log or e or a trig function. Basically, anything that's not a polynomial is then thrown into the family of transcendentals. And once you see that product between those two functions, it's a very strong um, uh, chance that it is a integration by parts problem. Now the trick with tic-tac-toe, and we can certainly try this, is as I let u be the x squared, I then get 2x, and then I get 2, and then I finally get 0. The problem is I have to be able to integrate the dv function an equal number of times. And although I may be able to integrate it once here quite easily, I integrating that you know, another time and then one more time beyond that becomes, you know, kind of a dead end. So right there I hit my dead end and I said, ah, oh, shucks. Okay, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to let dv be the ugliest thing that's integratable for me um, easily. And we don't necessarily consider the ln of x easily integratable, although it has come to be that way. So I let dv be the x squared, which then makes v one-third x cubed. Meanwhile, my u is going to be the natural log of x, and the du is going to be 1 over x. So let's plug those into the appropriate spots in our formula. And we could say u times v, so 1 third x cubed, natural log of x, minus the integral of v, I'll throw the 1 third out here, and du. Oh, look at that. How handy is that? So we're going to get the things to clean up a little bit here. We got our one-third x cubed 
ln of x minus one-third antiderivative of, let's see, x squared, I believe. And now I've just got to do one more very basic integration, and we're going to be all done here. So I'm thinking one-third x cubed natural log of x. Now my coefficient's going to be one-ninth x cubed. By the time I do a one-third times a one-third, then we'll throw our plus c on there for the constant, and that is my final antiderivative. Our next example is not too bad. It's just we're going to throw some bounds on there because I think we need more practice with definite integrals and parts. So we've got the polynomial 7 minus 3x times e to the 6x. And so right there you see the product of a polynomial and a transcendental function. So you're starting to think of parts. And again the question becomes, does tic-tac-toe work? And I believe it's going to work great on this particular problem. And that's going to help us get our antiderivative. So we have our signs. We start, we start with a plus and then we alternate. We've got our u and that's going to be the polynomial 7 minus 3x whose first derivative is negative 3 and second derivative already 0. That's great. Now watch out for this dv rascal. <clears throat> We've got e to the 6x. The first antiderivative is 1 6 e to the 6x. And then the second antiderivative is 1 36 e to the 6x. Now, we've got to go a little across and down just to set up our antiderivative. I think I've got to shrink my pen here just a little bit to fit it in. So I've got, let's see, 1 6 e to the 6x, 7 minus 3x. And then I think I got a plus because of the two negatives. 3 over 36 reduces to 1 12th e to the 6x. That's my antiderivative. And now I want to acknowledge my bounds of 0 and 1. And I tell you what, I want you to raise your hand if you fell into that bear trap last week where you just saw, saw a lower bound of 0 and assumed that plugging it in would give you 0. I'll tell you what, a lot of us fell into that bear trap. I think it was like the second question on the exam. How many people answered number two incorrectly and lost four points? So we'll go ahead and put your hand down. Um, we need to plug in both the one and the zero. All right, let's plug in. Whoops, 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 whoops. Grab that pen. Okay. Plug in the one. Let's see. I got one-sixth e to the six. And then seven minus three is four. Plus one twelfth e to the six. Is this nasty or what, huh? Minus. All right, now plug in the lower bound, zero. It's not going to give us a bunch of zeros like you might have guessed, all right? We've got uh, one six times now e to the zero is one. And then this seven minus zero is going to be seven, okay? Plus one twelfth. Oh my goodness gracious, let's clean this up just a little bit more. I've got two thirds e to the six, or two e to the six over three plus e to the 6 over 12. We're going to get common denominators there in a second. And then over here we've got 7, 6 minus a 12th. Again, we'll get common denominators there. And by the time we're all said and done, we're going to have 3 e to the 6 minus 5 all over 4. That's what I had with my common denominators and such. So the good use of a definite integral there and Oh, good. Always be on your toes. Let's not assume that every time we see a bound of zero, that it'll yield zeros when we plug it in. So, well, here we brought back a, a problem that we saw a couple weeks ago. Probably our most infamous, infamous problem from that 2008 exam was this number 22. And as we did corrections uh, that Monday and Tuesday after the exam, this was by far the most popular question that was brought to my attention. And the trick is, when they ask you for this integral right here, I don't know if necessarily integration by parts is the first thing that comes to our mind, but basically, uh, by default or lack of uh, other options, I kind of stumbled upon integration by parts out of desperation. And so we had to decide, you know, if we are going to go down that road, how do we even start? Well, I tell you what, we got to pick our dv first, and the only thing that's integratable there is the g prime of x which then means v is g of x. Meanwhile, easy Bailey, quiet down. Let's see, our u is then the f of x, which means du is f prime of x. And now we can all plug it all together here. Well, I can scroll back up, we'll catch that table here later. Let's see, u times v, so that's f of x times g of x. 
And it just seems like any time we get, you know, keep things general in terms of F and G, it gets a little feistier all of a sudden instead of just giving us some polynomials to work with. And then we've got our VDU. So our g of x times our f prime of x. Now remember, there was bounds on the original integral that we started with up here, so that 0 and 1. And that 0 and 1 apply to the entire problem. So not only did the 0 and 1 go here, but they also apply to the first term there, 0 to 1. So I need f of 1, g of 1, minus f of 0, g of 0, and then nicely, that, that second integral right here, from all the way through here, they told me that that guy was 5. So we got minus 5 down there. And then we're just going to go back up. We're going to read the table to get f of 1, g of 1, f of 0, g of 0. But at this point, I think I feel pretty confident in our ability to cross the finish line successfully. I just wanted to reiterate how we started the problem up here and get, her, get the ball rolling. All right, we're going to buzz through the second half of our lesson uh, in a much quicker pace. Integration by parts, I think you'd, or I'm sorry, by partial fractions is arguably one of the easiest topics we've encountered all year. Um, in effect, you did most of the work last year in pre-calc, and uh, the ones you saw last year in pre-calc were significantly harder. And this was a nice type-up that I found from a fellow colleague in a different part of the country, and they said they're going to limit our partial fractions to simple, linear, non-repeating factors and that right there made our life so much easier the fact that not only do we not have to worry about quadratics but we don't have to worry about those repeating factors and those are the real annoying ones but anyway when you do get to college in the near future hopefully for most of you you I just want you to know that there are much more challenging ones out there and I don't want you to think we've conquered the entire realm of partial fractions uh, we will be using partial fractions when our denominator is factored into the product of linear non-repeating factors. It involves splitting up a single fraction into the sum or difference of multiple fractions. I like to call that process there in the last sentence decomposition. We are decomposing um, one fraction into two smaller components. So let's go ahead and we'll jump into one example and we'll pretty much call it a day after that. So let's finish strong here. We've got x minus 1 all over x squared minus x. Again, I mean, when my eyes set on this problem for at first, I don't go into the problem hoping for partial fractions necessarily because as easy as it is, it's very time consuming. So, but, uh, you know, I might have tried letting u equal the denominator and when I tried that, I said, hey, what if u was x squared plus x? I got a du of 2x plus 1, and unfortunately that did not cancel out the numerator. So I hit a dead end, all right, and that didn't work. And so now I started to think, what if I went off to the side and I tried to decompose this rascal, and I got x minus 1 all over x quantity x plus 1, and I know that that's equal to the sum of a over x uh, plus b all over x plus 1. And at this point, we've got a whole, whole lot of algebra and pre-cal kicking in right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to attack this uh, fractional equation by multiplying the LCD through. To wipe out the denominators, we get x minus 1 is equal to a times the quantity x plus 1 plus b times x. And now I'm just going to pick very convenient values of x. The first one, I'm going to, I'm going to let x equal negative 1, which as I plug that in across the board from left to right, I got negative 2 is equal to a times 0, which is dead, and then negative b, which means 2 is equal to b. My next favorite value is I'm going to let x equal a 0 here, and that gives me negative 1 is equal to a, straight up. Okay, those are my two coefficients. Uh, and basically what I'm going to now do is I'm going to replace this integral with a brand new one, and we're going to have negative 1 over x, plus 2 all over x plus 1. And now I'm just going to integrate each one individually. I've got negative natural log of x plus 2 times the natural log of x plus 1. Looks like I forgot my absolute values back there. Plus c. And of course they could use their natural log properties to get a little feistier and try to disguise that answer. But uh, this is certainly our antiderivative and if they had specific bounds on it we could then apply them here. Uh, one other quick note before we end for the night. I want to watch out, you know, sometimes you'll get a, you know, here's an example that you might finish with. You know, what if you had 5 over 3x plus 1 and you were integrating that? What would your coefficient be? 
you know, uh, we're trying to do all that u sub in our heads. We're trying to let u equal 3x plus 1. We're trying to calculate the du and make that substitution all in our heads to save time. Hopefully you see a coefficient of 5 thirds natural log of 3x plus 1. Okay? What if, again, what if, what if it was 5 all over x plus 1 quantity squared? Would you still have an ln n in your answer? Well, in this particular case, I would want you to rewrite it as 5 quantity x plus 1 to the negative 2. All right, and we're going to stay away from the ln on this one. Um, we're still going to, you know, be careful, go through a u sub, let u equal that inner function. Good news is du equals dx. So what's going to happen is we are going to add 1 to that exponent and divide by that new exponent. We've got our constant. And so negative 5 all over x plus 1 would be our antiderivative. And of course, if you didn't feel comfortable and you weren't 100% sure, what could you do? Of course, we could take this rascal's derivative and see if it took us back to here. And I think it certainly would. So hopefully you like the integration by parts and you're ready for all the curveballs they might throw at us. The partial fractions, fortunately, are much more straightforward. I think it's one of the easiest topics we'll see all year.